which kind of freedoms, maybe also which kind of uh, counter effects. Uh, we have three fabulous speakers to discuss that. And uh, we will go first with uh, Jan Chipches, who's a, a designer and a researcher and an anthropologist, and he travels around the world uh, for uh, his employer, Nokia, to figure out how people relate to technologies and use technologies. Jan Chipches. Hello. So you're tired, you've been in town all day, you've been shopping maybe, and you want to rest some, and you want to do some kind of stuff. And then you come across this scene here, and just imagine for the moment that the seat on the left is empty, and you're wondering whether this is a suitable place for you to do the things that you want to do. So just look at that photo, just let's ask a few questions. So um, what is this space? What can you do here? What does it support? Is it the kind of place that you could have a telephone conversation? Is it the kind of place that you'd feel comfortable opening a laptop? Could you smoke here? If it was hot, could you take your shirt off? What kind of services does this space support? What about the guy there? To what extent is the guy in the white, who's sitting there or lying there, to what extent does his presence affect what choices you make? What if I was to tell you that that guy in the white shirt, he graduated top of his university uh, in his classes. He's a, a brilliant student. Or what if I was to tell you that uh, he has a really bad credit rating? Or actually that he has almost no friends. And what is he doing? And how does what he's doing affecting you, uh, affect whether you want to enter this space? So if I was to tell you that he's actually a medical student and right now he is revising for his final exams, he's going to be a heart surgeon. And then he's going to set up a charity and he's going to treat kids for free. How does that affect whether you're going to come into this space? And maybe whether you're going to interact with him as well. What if I was to tell you that right now he's watching an adult movie? Or right now he's on eBay and he's just putting the final bid in on, a, on an auction for something? Or actually right now he's on the conference website and he's writing bad things about you? And actually I can tell you all of this, but I know he's doing all of these things right now. He's doing all of these things at once. And how does that affect, if you have that knowledge, whether you enter this space? What about um, if you knew that he's going to be there for another four hours? Or if you knew that he's going to be there for another two minutes? How does that affect what you're going to do next? So um, I'm Jan Chipchase. I work for Nokia Design. Um, where I specialize in doing human behavioral research, going into different situations around the world, looking at how people behave, and particularly with technology, and uh, thinking how they might behave in the future. And I use that information, and the team that I'm in uses that information, to build up a picture of how the world might be in the future. And we do that so uh, on, one, on one side to design for that future, and I spend a lot of time with the, with the team designing things, and actually Raphael, who presented earlier, is, and we're part of the same team. Um, and also we try and challenge assumptions in the, companies about, in the company about um, what people think the future will be like as well. I live in Japan, it's been my home for the last eight years, this is my toaster, and uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that with a pair of South Korean chopsticks probably get electrocuted. Um, I spend a lot of my time traveling um, because I work for a global company and we sell products in all the markets around the world. And we're interested in not only the similarities between cultures, but also the differences between cultures. And these are just some of the places that I've been to in the last uh, few years. Um, last year, we did a big study on urban shanty towns, the places Bruce talked about earlier. So we spent a year looking at how people with very limited access to things like water, electricity, maybe they don't have land rights. Um, 
how they live their lives, and we looked at opportunities. Um, again, within the three to 15 year time frame, uh, opportunities for design. I spend a lot of the time, and the, the team I'm with, spend a lot of the time on the streets. I mean, we, we specialize in qualitative research. And so, for example, we might go to Ho Chi Minh City, and we might spend time looking at commuter habits in, in Ho Chi Minh City in, in Vietnam. Or we might go to a household like this in Daravi in Mumbai. This is a one-room apartment. It's six square meters. Four people live there. Um, this is essentially in what many people would call shanty towns or slums. Um, we look in the communities and we look outside the home, but we, we often start from the home, but we look outside the home. And, and this is uh, um, advertising in an apartment block in Handan in China. Um, most of those adverts are for sewage removal services, by the way. And all the while we're looking for, and we're looking at how technologies are being used. And technologies can be things as obvious as a computer, but they can be pretty much anything. I mean, everything at some point is technology, right? Until you get used to it. This, by the way, is in Handan in China, and it's in a village where some guy has rigged his computer up to the internet, and he, he now sideloads content onto customers' mobile phones. Sometimes we take uh, physical prototypes of things that we think are viable in the future. And we take them out into the public space or private spaces as well. So this is an example of this. So this lady in the, the middle is an actor who we hired, an actress who we hired. And we also hired actors as well. They were actually students, but they're always acting. And she's wearing a head-mounted display, a design of which would be feasible in the future. So it's way smaller than the head-mounted displays that you can imagine today. And her job was to go into public spaces, a variety of public spaces, and act out various use cases. And by doing this, and we did this in Tokyo and New York, by doing this, we got a real good, really good understanding of um, the very practical issues related to um, interaction and setup and where you might keep it when it's out of use. But maybe more interesting than that is the social kind of aspects of this looking at how people reacted to the behavior of someone using a head-mounted display in public spaces. And the rest of this presentation is really about behaviors. And um, it's very difficult to consent, condense a lot of research into a presentation, but I've touched on the bits that I think would interest you. So behaviors. So you've probably seen this. You've probably seen someone sitting at a table and they're alone and they've got a clamshell phone, a flip phone, and the screen is open and they're checking status information. And the status information could be simply be the time or more likely it's checking for incoming communication. And we see a lot of this, particularly with younger women. This is in Japan, where uh, younger women are placing the phone in such a way that the phone is a proxy for a person in some ways, that it sends a signal to other people, not only am I connected, but they're here. And we see that in the way, subtly, the way that people place the object. You may have seen this, and this again is in Japan. It's someone who took a call at very short notice, and then at very short notice, tried to find and create a space in which it was uh, practical and suitable, socially suitable, um, to uh, actually conduct a call. And you'll notice that this person is not just standing at the wall, he's standing at a point in the wall where he's close to things that jut out of the wall. So it's kind of, if you think, it's actually quite a sophisticated thing that's going on here, even though it looks quite basic. And we tend to see a lot of um, behaviors where people try and um, uh, extenuate the features of, the, of the, the object that they're using, but also show their intent to other people. So this is a headset, a mobile phone headset, and it's being held in the hand and speaking in, into the headset like this. And it does two things. <clears throat> so one thing it does is it should cut out ambient noise, and it should enable the person who's speaking to speak more quietly. But it does another thing, and that is it's, this is in a cafe, which is a um, highly sociable non-workspace. 
people don't come here to work. And this is a work call, and this is about sending the intent of, I know I'm doing a work call, I know I'm in your, your social space, I'm trying to keep the noise down, I'm aware of it. Sometimes we reach the boundaries of um, kind of use, of what is considered acceptable use. We did a study in the UK um, where we interviewed a cafe owner who really disliked people using laptops in the cafe. And this is actually my colleague, Younghee, who was presenting it last year's lift. Um, but the, the cafe owner really li disliked people using uh, laptops. And if he saw someone opening laptops in the cafe, and it wasn't this cafe, but it's indicative of it. If he saw someone opening a laptop in the cafe, he would send one of his workers, one of his co-workers, to clean up around the person. And 10 minutes later, if the laptop was still open, they would go up and they would wipe around the person again. And he joked that if they still didn't get the message that it was inappropriate behavior, he would then get out the disinfectant, a powerful disinfectant like bleach, and clean up around to send a really song signal. And it was a joke, but that was his intent. And so we see these kind of reactions to what is appropriate behavior, and, and a subtle one which I've seen in many different cultures, I don't really know whether it's um, appropriate for South Korea, is tutting, and that's simply, and that's um, non-spoken, uh, as in words, uh, signal to other people that what you're doing is inappropriate. If too many people do things that are inappropriate, at some point you'll get signage that comes up. The first signage tends to be handwritten, and then at some point it tends to be formalized in some way. This is from Taiwan. It's not really about technology per se. So no pets, no outside food, uh, no alcoholic drinks, and no playing poker. And actually, the thing I like about signs is they are articulations of, often, there are articulations of that boundary between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And they're also, they're telling you the direction in which society wants to go, or some people in society wants to go. And the key with any sign is to look at by whose authority. And then the question is whether you respect that authority. But we also find situations where people want to use technology, but they're really not supposed to in particular places. And this photo is from the UK, but it's a reenactment of something that we found in South Korea during a study that we did in Seoul on mobile television use. And a teenage girl was talking about when she was in the classroom, um, she would set her mobile TV up in her glasses case. She would open the glasses case. Maybe some of you have a similar experience, right? You put the phone in there. It slams shut, but it's still on. You turn the volume down. Your teacher just looks at a glasses case. You, you're looking at the latest basketball game, right? The point about this is, whatever the technology is, whatever the space is, um, there'll be a percentage of people who will want to do whatever they want to do in your space. And from our perspective, how do we design for that? Okay. So some of the trends and the new practices, um, some of the trends and the new behaviors that we're, we're anticipating and seeing. So, uh, in terms of trends, more and more of what you use in daily life is becoming pocketable. And what I simply mean by that is it fits in your pocket. And the thing about things that fit in your pocket is that they get carried in pockets and bags. And they get carried into contexts where people don't necessarily anticipate their use. And often they find themselves in situations where there's some pressure to use these objects in those contexts. And so you get this kind of behavioral leakage where behaviors move from one space to another. The thing with this is, you've got to ask is, within what time frame of all the stuff that I'm, in, uh, that I'm doing, will it be able to fit into my pocket? And then, what things will it connect to out there in the service cloud? These two people on the right of the photo, they're both watching mobile TV. They're standing outside Shibuya Station in Tokyo. And as far as I, I know, they're watching the same TV program. And when you have objects in people's pockets that have similar functionality, I think you're going to see a lot of this kind of serial solitary um, kind of uh, interaction, human interaction and uh, space. And I think one of the reasons is that 
with a few exceptions, it's inherently easier to design for single use than to design for shared use. Shared use is complex. You've got to think so many different variables. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of this in one, one form or another. There's been a lot of buzz about sharing, about um, YouTube, MySpace, and um, one of the things about sharing is, I mean, it's inherently human. Um, it's mostly positive. But when technologies are introduced into the marketplace that, have, that are social by nature, whether you adopt that technology, it's not a question of whether you opt into that technology. It can become a question of whether you're opting out of society. Another trend is the distance between when a question is asked and when the answer appears. And that gap is closing. And increasingly, we're going to see real-time kind of question answering. And I think we're going to actually see a fair amount of predictive um, answering of, of things that, that could happen in the future. So that when you see the guy sitting on the chair, or when you see this guy here, you will know that much more about him and her. And not just the things that they want to present to you. This is me. This is, I'm Jan Chipcho. Take, take my website. But all the stuff around it all the stuff that maybe they don't want you to know. In an age of mass production, and Raphael touched upon um, the $5 kind of phone, or the, what happens when, when mobile phones cost $5. In an age of mass production, technology is getting into people's hands. The stuff that we assume to be a technology, it's getting into people's hands at a younger age. And the issue there is that the gap between what is a socially, the social norm or the social norms that have yet to evolve for people who are younger, the distance between that and your social norm, I think is going to grow. We all know that the boundary between work and social life is blurring. And this is an example from uh, Cleveland, where a gentleman who's uh, commuting to work, he's got his Blackberry and uh, he's checking his mail. He's checking his work mail before he gets into the office. So uh, this is um, you know, a fairly typical uh, situation. It takes real discipline to maintain those boundaries. My question to you is, as designers, to what extent can we articulate in the designs that we come up with, can we articulate those boundaries for people to make those boundaries uh, easier to, be, uh, to adhere to? In uh, a study that we did in Iran, uh, we interviewed one young lady who uh, talked about uh, when she goes out in public, she wears a headscarf. But at home, she doesn't wear a headscarf when she's with her, her, her close female friends. And some of those friends are taking pictures. And they're taking pictures often with their camera phones. And then the pictures that they take, they stay on the phone. And then when they go out socially and they're at university, and maybe they're at a meal, and the camera, the camera phone gets passed around, and people start looking at photos. And so this, um, this kind of notion of um, she's not going to be seen by um, uh, people other than her family members, for example, without a headscarf, those kind of barriers start getting um, broken down. I've traveled a lot and I've seen a lot of things. And the thing that constantly surprises me is the speed at which particular particularly pocketable technologies are adopted. So the speed at which a high-tech piece of kit in uh, Seoul or London ends up uh, in Lhasa or Lagos. And it's not necessarily it starts at the beginning of the week in, in one place and at the end of the week it's in another place in a, in a mass market way. But if you think of the volumes of, of devices that are being created, and once their lifetime has reached a natural end uh, in, a, in a market like Seoul, the speed at which they then find their way into other markets where there is demand for them. So there's 6.6 .6 odd billion people on the planet. There's um, half a billion uh, mobile phones will be sold this year. No, sorry, 1.2 uh, billion. Nokia will make half a billion mobile phones this year, approximately. So the speed at which the change occurs, and I think actually we're going to reach a point, particularly when people are connected and on the software side, we're going to reach a point where um, the lifetime of services 
could be reduced down to, and, and still be commercially viable, can be reduced to hours. The service that you provide, their lifetime is an hour or two. This photo, by the way, is from Lassa. It's a photo studio. Um, and it's the contrast between Han Chinese and uh, native uh, Tibetans. So earlier I talked about pocketable. Um, actually, I kind of lied to you because um, pocketable is just a step, really. And pocketable is a step to stuff becoming invisible. And um, if you look at technology trends and if you look at miniaturization in particular, and then other things like flexible componentry, we're going to we're going to not see a lot of technology. And I don't mean invisible in the sense of it disappears into the infrastructure. I mean simply that you can be using it and other people do not know you're using something. It's not as elegant as the kind of seamless invisibility that designers often strive for. And if you think about, um, if you think about the social cues that we learn to communicate what it is that we're doing, and you think about when things are technically invisible, what those social cues will be. So, started the presentation with a lot of questions. I have way more questions than answers, and that's kind of what we do. Um, I think I'll call it a day. Thank you very much. And don't go away. This is not a technology that's going to disappear soon. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, my mum never believes me that I come to these things. So if it's with your permission, I'd just like to take a photo of you. So if everyone can smile, just a second. Actually, yeah. Go, let's take, go ahead, let's take two pictures. Go for the first. OK. So everybody say cheese. Okay. And then, I don't know, do something. Raise your hands. Play the game with the bombs and the phones. Something. Okay. Everybody, oh. raise your hands. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jan. You're nuts. Jan Chipchase. <laughs>